Hello. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Monday, a change to the usual schedule. Um, I'm so sorry I wasn't there for you last week. Uh, I was, <laughs> as I put on my LinkedIn post that generated a bit of interest, I was out doing proper work. But thanks to Sabio, my partners for this episode, um, this is proper work, isn't it? So uh, thank you for joining me. Hey, Phil, how you doing? We caught up last week. It was lovely to see Phil properly. Um, oh, good. Cam's here. What's up? <laughs> Let's go back to the early 2000s. Oh, look, we are honored. The legend is here. Chris, I'm amazed you're here with everything that you've got going on. And I'm going to see you uh, see you tomorrow, which is why this show is um, today. So, oh, look, Clayton's here as well. Morning all. Happy Monday. It is now you're here, Clayton. Slam. Slam Duggan. I am sorry. Disgraceful <laughs> behavior last week. Although it did lead to your um, amazing image. <laughs> I often compare myself. Was it? It's not Pablo Escobar, is it? Is it? Um, that meme. Richie. Hello, mate. How are you doing? And Nick. Oh, we've got everyone here today. Scott, now I'm very sorry. I confused Scott with someone else um, and sent him a very random message. Scott, I'm I'm very sorry. <laughs> Josh, good morning, sir. How are you? Now then, Chris is on his way to Nottingham. Now, better to do until I get there. I will be in Nottingham tomorrow as well at the forums conference. So, um, ah, oh, great. I'll see you tomorrow too then, Martin. Brilliant. Hopefully, um, anyone that's come in it'll be great to to meet you all in um person pablo escobar it's pronounced papasmith good danny's here i can i can breathe a sigh of relief um so i do want to share though because i do want to include you all and again i am sorry slam duggan is right i'm very very sorry um that i i missed last tuesday um Hello, hello, Leon. New to all this, all ears. Coming back to this interesting industry after some time in the automation sector. Well, welcome back. Um, welcome back indeed. Yes, good. And Nick's here. Guys, thank you all so much for um, being here on a Monday as well and switching things up. I do appreciate it. It won't happen very often. I won't let, I won't let you down. But I did want to share with you what I was doing last week at the British Library, um, DDC are doing this thing called DDC Discusses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the week before. Sorry, Phil. Oh, dear. I promise to be more consistent. Oh, Gareth, good morning from Cape Town. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hopefully sunny, sunny SA, let's hope. Um, I will be more consistent, but let me let me stop waffling and share with you what was discussed at DDC discusses. They're trying to combine our industry with the academic world. So they've had Elizabeth Stoko, um, who has written a great book called Talk. And also, oh God, I wondered if this would come up. Great day to be a Newcastle fan. Just needed to get that off my chest. Well, as you know, I'm a Tottenham fan. Um, and yesterday I was playing football and uh, I, I was just flabbergasted that after 20 minutes, Tottenham were 3-0 down. Um, so as you can imagine, the rest of the people playing were all uh, very sympathetic and supportive and none of them took the mickey out of me at all. Good morning from Johannesburg, South Africa. Good morning. Hello, Morris. How are you doing? <laughs> Now, about time, I'm not sure, does that relate to Tottenham or um, something else? Right. I want to share with you what I learned. So I was saying about Elizabeth Stokoe was the first academic presenter that DDC um, brought to the party. On last Tuesday, it was a guy called Dr. Saul Albert. Was it Albert? I think so. Uh, yes, Dr. Saul Albert. Um, now... I'm going to go back and share with you things I have learned this week. 
Um, so to start with, he spoke about chat GPT, still a very, very much a, a hot topic. Um, ah, I see, Morris, about time we use science. I couldn't agree more. I think um, applying science and acad the academic mindset to our industry. Now, Dr. Saul was just itching to get at data from what we do, having a brew in my Spurs cup, but it keeps sliding down the table. Danny, there's been uh, many, many jokes. Um, so conversation is a social technology, and he showed that ChatGPT cannot actually chat. And these are his views. I'm sharing them um, with you now. And who am I to argue? This is a guy who is a conversational scientist and studies um, conversation. Hence his point that conversation is a social technology and it's a nice way of thinking about things. I also liked how he said we need to think about conversational AI as a social prosthetic, that it can assist us when when needed, um, but it isn't probably yet as good as a real thing, but could become even better than the real thing. I really, these are some of the takeaways from what was a, a fascinating couple of hours. We make speech errors every three seconds and we repair those errors instantly. And that by repairing, as I just made a mistake then, but by repairing, the listener engages with the person who is who is talking. And this is a necessary part of the patterns of our conversation. Um, conversation is made up of social actions and patterns where we expect things to happen in a certain way. So greetings, offers, acceptance, go-aheads, tellings, which it will include storytellings. And he showed through some videos and some recordings of people talking, these types of things of go-ahead. So if we were in a room now and I was talking, you would be saying, go on, or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. those would be your go-aheads. Um, Morris, I've been promoting Elizabeth Stokoe's work for nine years. Same, my friend, and it's great to see, isn't it? I think her, her book Talk has been out for at least five now. Phil, I agree. It's an enhancement to the experience for both advisors and customers, but in no way fit to replace human interaction yet. And it was, Phil, that's a really good point. It was quite reassuring to hear uh, Dr. Saul, as I called him, <laughs> which he's didn't prefer he preferred just Saul um but I was saying so Dr Saul what's your view in should we be worried are we heading for a Skynet Terminator type um scenario and Phil you'd be pleased to know he agreed that kind of social the the prosthetic analogy is because it's a long way away from or it's some way away from having conversations um and he ended with we don't understand interactions well enough to design systems to replace them. And um, better call him, better call him Saul. Yeah. <laughs> Great series, that one. Um, and by this, what Dr. Saul was saying was that the the science of understanding conversation is still relatively relatively new. So there is still so much more we can learn. What I thought was the way that he spoke about patterns and acceptance and greetings and tellings and offerings, aren't these the things that should be baked into our quality monitoring, baked into our training, to really, really understand how best to converse and how to help our teams converse better? You know, this these are some of the things that... Um, I found absolutely fascinating. And from the academic world's point of view, that, that we had a great conversation after his presentation around some of the interactions that you will be hearing every single day. Um, and there's real interest from the academic world in understanding or the conversational science world from we record everything. So the connection between the two better enables them to understand their science and better enables us to understand conversations. So um, 
here we go sorry let me catch up with some we're losing a lot of proper conversations by just using social networks online that would have been a great question to ask um that's brilliant feels very much like cryptocurrency huge rush to be part of it lots of noise nobody really understands its actual use yet then the bubble burst settles down then the real value and innovation starts similar to nfts i guess as well phil great point phil duggan great point enable people with technology rather than replace as you guys do nick very true now uh so i will i wanted to keep you up to date of what i was doing but i have a question for you now this is because I'm heading to the forums conference tomorrow. I'm really looking forward to it. It will be a great event. And we're heading to that time, aren't we, where there's a lot of events coming. And I just wondered, from your point of view, uh, and maybe this will help people who put events together, here's the question for the day. What are the best and worst things about industry events? Um let me just start this little ticker. What are the best and worst things about industry invent events? Let's just go back. Phil Duggan, very much so. Don't be distracted by the shiny, shiny. Feels like a tool looking for a problem. Uh, that's great. Scott, I see the main challenge being that interacting with a chat GPT or similar is that the user knows that it can never truly offer genuine empathy. Very, very true. Very true. What are the best and worst things about industry events? And um, from my point of view, I, I can absolutely say, and I really like how the forum, if you have a look at their agenda for tomorrow, there's key parts in there that are specifically designed for you to network. And that could be catching up with people that um, you know, or meeting new people. And I really like that there's spa dedicated space in there for that, because I think that's often um, missing. Now then, clashes. Considering the industry is about networking and collaboration, there are so many that clash date-wise and feel like they're competing for our attention and attendance. Very true. Overly pushy sales guys peddling technology at events. Sorry, guys. Uh, well, it's true, Slam Duggan, isn't it? Um, and I, I have been at events exhibiting in previous roles. Um, I would never say I was pushy, but we've all been there at the expo when you can see people looking at you kind of like, please come over. Um, I was one of them once. So uh, the single-minded narratives that's pushed, not as open-minded as before. That's very interesting. I can't actually see... Who you are. Danny Wareham is our technical support. Maybe he can help you out there with the settings. Uh, human conversations. Best scale for me negates it sometimes by rushing those conversations. Would love more smaller events. Interesting. Best thing. Learning. Networking. Very true, Gareth. Worst. <laughs> Greasy sales pitches. Very true. Now, which category does this fall in, Danny? freebies how many biros and window scrapers do we need i've never actually got a window scraper i wouldn't mind i wouldn't mind a window scraper i think everyone's always looking for the new as well rather than three-year-old jelly beans <laughs> ah belinda a have you tried turning it off and back on again there we go worse from leon let's have a look no new dynamics same old stuff best other side of the same coin re-engaging with folks we trust and sharing new perspectives lovely a lovely comment no new dynamics i think a lot of uh, and from mike good to see you mike by the way uh if you haven't already mike does a lovely um youtube uh post about cx wake up to cx on a friday morning as a sales guys i'm feeling targeted i need love i love you mate uh do it again danny's on the case here it's in your privacy settings for visibility in your li account i like learning talking together from nick hearing what's going on disliked the rush connected with sales demos were always interesting that's true that's true slam duggan has a ring central stress ball from last year's expo that's still going strong <laughs> At the industry events, we sometimes forget about the people behind it all. 
Yes, I agree, Claire. And I think the expo is an interesting one, isn't it? I think if um, you didn't know our industry and turned up at the Call and Contact Centre Expo, certainly a couple of years ago or pre-pandemic, very technology heavy. I thought last year's actually was there was more of a of a balance. Um, and that isn't just because I spoke at that one. I genuinely thought I, over both days there was a bit more of a of a balance. Um, I think, and again, I th- I'm pretty sure, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, I know you're probably on a train or in the car or something, but from one of the earlier points about clashes, I think that's a really good shout. I tried to do something on the early one of these shows where um, I would share different events that were happening. But Chris, I think you're very keen on getting a bit more coordinated with other organizations aren't you i know that's something you've spoken to me about here we go we try to offer a mix of everything some broadcast lots of collaboration networking and if we do have suppliers speaking we are clear the opportunity isn't to pitch it's to offer guidance support and share knowledge we want every delegate to learn something and make sure they leave with a new thought idea or renewed enthusiasm wow Chris has done that off the cuff and you can tell he believes it and lives it because what a, what a lovely paragraph that is. And I, I will say I concur. The forum events are all about learning and gaining something new for, for sure. Um, contact center industry. It's a great place where we all get along. Also contact center industry. Take a stress ball. You need it. <laughs> Very true. We all love a stress ball though. Um, so Chris, I couldn't agree more. I'm looking forward to, um, tomorrow for sure. Keep the comments coming. Cause I think this is really, it's going to be really helpful for people that put events together. Um, Nick, here we go. The point about the tech is a good one. Conventionally and continuing today, tech is the enabler, but not the driver. How can events become more about people, customers and expectations, employees and needs? than the tech the tech then needs to be used to address those really true um i'll back up what chris says the former great for guidance never feels salesy um yeah i would agree 100 percent um but these are all uh, you know that the this kind of input i imagine is going to be is going to be really really helpful to people putting things together because it can be um, a bit dizzying, can't it? Nick Sellers claps. <laughs> Danny's clapping you loudly, Nick. This is true. And how do we take this and make it make it so in our industry events? Maybe the people curating those kind of events, much like Chris, could be active in these types of um, forums as well. So blue, 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 there's a an error that I'm correcting. Um, please do keep these ideas and thoughts coming but uh, you'll be pleased to know we're at the next stage of the show and I've even put together I've done a little bit of prep I'm trying to make up Phil for not being here last Tuesday so we're now at a section of the show it's got its own little segue are you ready here we go What do you think? <laughs> it's time for the read along. So we are doing Contact Babel's decision maker guide read along. Um, and we are now up to about a page 170, which is the IDNV fraud security section. So the first thing to share is this. And this is the proportion of calls that are requiring caller identification an average time taken to get the customer through that uh, identification. Um, so the proportion of calls requiring ID and V, you can see, and you guys are better at this analysis than me. I'm just sharing it. However, the proportion of calls requiring ID and V seems to be pretty static going all the way back to 2011, uh, 70%, all the way through to, 2022 at 68 percent let me just catch up a sec 
I was at a CIPD event last year, and the two underlying themes were AI's role in recruitment and leveraging your human capital. When did a people-focused conference more away from people? Um, <laughs> there we go. That VT needs a BAFTA. Thank you very much. You should work for Canva. <laughs> Hugo does my Canva work. Uh, the events require sales to help fund, but we need to find a way to make the sales less salesy. The ongoing struggle. Discovery isn't a sale. Very, very true. Demos are two-way. Again, Mike's talking truth here. We learn what to build from you, the guys and girls in the trenches. Don't fear us. I don't think we do, uh, Mike. It's um, a really good point. But let's get back to this. So what I thought was interesting is what the Contact Babel have shown over the last two years is that um, the average ID and V time has massively increased. Uh, you can see here uh, all the way up to now 44 seconds for ID and V. And you think at a time when we are um, certainly in a far more advanced position from a technology point of view, that ID and V time has gone up. Um, and Contact Babel say the main reason for that is more stringent security checks. And the next slide is how, what is the identification method? So you can see that still 89% of the people that were researched uh, said that it's their agents that are doing ID and V followed by IVR, touch tone, speech recognition, and biometrics. And they note here the total is greater than 100%, as some calls may require multiple identification methods. There's another table that I didn't share that showed that with the 6 billion inbound calls that our industry takes a year, what this time equates to from a cost point of view. So... The 44 seconds, the increase, the fact that it's agents doing the ID and V in the high proportion of um, occasions has a huge financial impact. It, even with that, in, in addition, I would say we need to think about what that means from a customer point of view as well. Um, Phil, here we go. I always think having more relatable case studies at events and less polished sales pitches would make them more bearable. Very, very true, Phil. Um, so from an ID and V point of view, here we go. The fear of GDPR fines is being pummeled into the front lines. Very true. Security is a nightmare in South Africa, really. Would you say it's more than the... 44 seconds that's reported in this um, Contact Babel report, which kind of predominantly only focuses on the UK. But it would be interesting to know how, what that's like for you guys over in South Africa. For those of you that don't know, um, Matt Smallman was a guest on the podcast and spoke about this, spoke about this kind of security gatekeeping and the use of speech recognition and voice biometrics. And um, he wrote a book on it, in fact. I can't remember the, the name of the book offhand, but um, I would recommend listening to his episode and checking out his book because I think he would have some views on this for sure because we were at a point where we still have the majority of the time customers are ringing in. It's agents that are doing identification and verification for them. And it seems to be taking too long. And maybe that is because of the next section that is concerns about external fraud. And as you would have got used to, Contact Babel split the results based on contact center size. So you can see that um, small contact centers... 18% of those surveyed were very concerned about external fraud. The, the size that was most concerned, though, was large contact centers. Large contact centers, over 50% are somewhat or very concerned. Um, let me just catch up. Kirsty, this is an example where technology-based ID&V could hugely help AHT 
and leave agents to concentrate on valuable conversations. Couldn't agree more. So many calls go wrong just by the ID and V approach and how it can be received by a customer. Like you, Kirsty, I was kind of amazed by th these stats. I was amazed by this, to be honest. Um, and also this spike here at the time it's taking, the, how we're doing it. Um, and I guess this could be the, the cause, right? Um, yes, far more. And you will end up having to do a lot in person. This is a South Africa question. Thank you very much. Um, Danny, I was online checking my eligibility for broadband upgrade, logged in, completed security, and had to speak via web chat, then had to redo security questions with the first advisor and with the second transferred advisor. That tech disconnect between self-serve and contact center isn't helping. That, in a nutshell, Danny, I think is where, as an industry, we need to be, we need to be focusing. Uh, the speech voice tech rarely works. We are always asked to repeat it. Numbers on apps, forms, which bypass IVR, typically a lot better from a customer experience, but skipping security is a risk if your account is hacked. Yeah, I mean, these are all to protect us all from the worst possible things happening. Um, but it seems that we have some work to do to to get it right. So here you can see, and maybe if you're watching this and you are responsible for contact centers, would you agree with this around the, the level of concern about external fraud? And that is a caller pretending to be another person. Um, are you somewhat concerned, very concerned, a little concerned, or unconcerned? I quite like that 28% of the people in small contact centers were like, yeah, we're not bothered, <laughs> or we're unconcerned. Um, okay, this one gets a little bit big brotherish, I think. Um, what are your concerns about internal employee fraud? I think this is a disappointing but fascinating um, subject here because in large contact centers, you can see here that 54% that were surveyed were a little concerned, 23% were somewhat concerned, and 10% were very concerned about internal employee fraud. So I would love to dig into that a bit more. Um, Beverly was telling me recently about her water company that doesn't even have an IVR when you call them, and yet her customer service interaction was great. I wonder, thank you, Nick, for that. I wonder if, Bev, maybe you can tell me, our water company here, when you call them, it's like you're phoning someone uh, and they just sort of pick up the phone and go, hello. And you're like, hi, is this so-and-so water company? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How can I help? <laughs> it's, it's like you're their only customer. Um, so GDPR came into effect in 2019. It's no surprise that from 2020 onwards, we see that increase. Yeah, true. I think, um, some of the concerns around GDPR were unfounded, but, oh, here we go. In Africa, fraud is massive internal, especially really. Wow. As 111 and AA, they both had a recent print breach of the three fines issued by the ico this quarter two were against individuals breaching gdpr wow and uh steve sullivan's newsletter is really good for this type of thing mike isn't it but thank you for sharing that um brooke hello brooke i think the time it takes to idmv is increased due to customer awareness of fraud good point People are much less likely to confirm information now that they would have been maybe 10 years ago, so it can be more difficult to obtain. Very true. Bev, yeah, the same. They say their name, but Frontline does the triage. Yeah, very true. Like, Hello, how can I help? Um, so, internal employee fraud. Really? Are we that distrusting of our teams that we this concerned about internal fraud i worked in operations in financial services for many many years and i think it, during that time with the thousands of people that worked there i can remember two instances where 
people were up to no good um, and were dealt with and the systems and the processes we had in place found them, identified it, and it was dealt with um, accordingly. It would have been nice to have none, of course, but two out of thousands just from my own experience. This this figure surprised me. Um, does it surprise you or am I just a bit naive? <laughs> Maybe naive is the wrong word. Um, you know what I mean. <laughs> okay. So the next section is concerns about external IT attacks by contact center size. So are any of you involved in this type of world, in this type of preventative uh, measures? How often are you preventing attacks or dealing with attacks? Um Danny wades in on culture. Good. No, but it can be a symptom of creating a culture that relies on competition benchmarking between teams and channels or in-house versus outsource. Very true. So concerns about external IT attacks. We are concerned as an industry, uh, either 29% average, very concerned, 38% somewhat concerned. And I think it's, far more prevalent that we are very, very concerned about data. And I think that kind of sits even if we didn't have GDPR, the kind of the concern around customers' data being obtained nefariously is is very, very worrying. Um, Scott, would be interesting if there was a scatter graph uh, pitching concerns about internal fraud and basic salary offered. Yes, that would. I'm with you, Scott. I think it's a fascinating subject. I would love to be able to speak further to the people who responded that they are concerned um, about internal fraud. Now, hi, Neris. Neris, our contact center Fresh Prince, Fresh Princess is um, here, the rapping legend. Um, the number of attacks attempts that happen daily is staggering thankfully there are lots of good firewalls to prevent wow curious that the least concerned category is a small contact center perhaps thinking they're too small to be of interest to fraudsters yes yeah that's very true good point nick i wonder why um Danny Neris Caulfield, I heard a great stat from one of my networking group that stated over 90% of breaches are human-related, i.e. poor passwords, physical security of laptops. Wow. Um, I think, you know, it's difficult, isn't it? We, we interact with so many different um, organizations where our uh, password is required it can get difficult to, and I know that there are um, services and apps that will keep you all of those stored, um, but it can be dizzying at times. I've been contacted by a firm telling me they've been breached. My worry is I have no idea why they think they have my data. I'm on the case. Wow. Maybe that is a phishing attempt. Um the contact center should be minimally... Uh, hi, Simon. Uh, I think you're going to the forum tomorrow, aren't you? Um, good to catch up. The contact center should be minimally aware of IT attacks, whereas the dedicated IT teams should be keeping vulnerabilities to a minimum. Ah, I see. So the people that were being asked about this, I guess, um, that's coloring perhaps their judgment that they don't get shared the the true scale from their IT teams. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's an interesting um, section we are in at the moment in our read along. Um, so the next one was current and future use of voice biometrics by contact center size. And this is probably the graph that I've seen that has had the most uh, don't knows. Um, you can see that for the medium uh, section they don't know if they're going to use it or not there's a very small percentage that are using it now it's being used six percent 
of the respondees in large contact centers are using voice biometrics with a further 14% trialing it now or that they have a trial planned with 56% nothing planned. I, we may do so in the future. So you can see overall for our industry there is 12% are either using it now or trialing it or have a trial planned. 42%, nothing planned, may do so in the future. This graph doesn't really talk massively to we're on the case, does it? Uh, so I guess therein lies some real opportunity. Um, Simon Rowe, completely agree from Danny. We've already got front lines spinning enough plates, true, without them also having to be security savvy to this extent. That cognitive load, right, of our customer-facing frontline teams is massive. So it would seem voice biometrics is a technology that has um, some work to do. Um, voice biometrics has such a bad rep, thanks to the old train line, IVR. How are they now, Neris? <clears throat> Good question. That reminds me of pre of cloud doubt pre-covid true bev despite the hype i think it's not close to ready accuracy is key to compliance a lovely sentence and the tech is short of that benchmark thank you mike um now the final slide to share in uh, today's read along is about our pci dss compliance programs and who is running them by contact center size. So you can see a uh, self-assessment questionnaire, not externally audited, is the light blue. The dark blue is self-assessment questionnaire that is then externally audited. Green is you have an internal dedicated resource to deal with your PCI and compliance. And yellow is external qualified security assessor. So the, I guess the um, toughness of your measures going from left to right, but then you end with no compliant, no PCI compliance program at all. Six uh, percent average have nothing, all the way through to fourteen uh, percent who self-assess it but don't audit it. Thirty-three percent self-assess it but then get it audited. 36% have a dedicated PCI resource um, and 22% use external experts. Nick, from the last few graphs and the comments made, it, it sounds like the need for certainty about who is on the line and the lack of confidence in the tech means that agents and customers pick up the tab. Very true, Nick. And then after breaches, um, as we've seen, then companies ultimately pick up the tab in in fines and customers you're right pick it up through loss of their data but I, I i thought this was interesting in the in the um dedicated resource again why is there such a difference with large all the time um here we go bev not all levels of pci require external audit it's volume based volume of transactions very true um the level of revenue you take in your customer services determines your PCI compliance audit level. So this is a bit of a funny graph as they have to get it audited and have resource if they generate over um, a certain amount of dollar. Very true, Neris. Guys, thank you so much. You definitely, definitely know your stuff. I, I won't do my uh, VT again. Um, I'm very proud of it, the, the contact centre read-along. We are rattling through the 400-odd pages of Contact Babel Decision Makers Guide 2023. It'll be a little bit like the fourth bridge. I think once we finish painting it, by the time we finish, we'll have to go back and, and paint it again. So by the time we finish this, next year's will probably be out, and then we can just start reading uh, that along again. Oh, Matt, well, you'll have... I was talking about you earlier. Um, so 
Uh, you can watch this again on LinkedIn or on my YouTube channel, but I did call out your episode and also your book. Um, so by all means, please use this thread to weigh in and educate us because no one knows more about this than than yourself. Um, dedicated an external audit if financially viable, uh, if financially viable would be ideal in my opinion. The external audit then also becomes a learning exercise for internal teams. Um, Matt Smallman, what is the name of your book? There is Matt Smallman's book, Unlock Your Call Center, is in my bookshelf. Mine too. And thank you, Neris. Unlock Your Call Center. So, Matt, I'm I'm very pleased you're <laughs> run the VT. Run the VT. Go on then. There we go. <laughs> so um Yes, Matt, please do uh, come in and let us know. Uh, Use this thread because I'm sure people will be uh, looking at it afterwards. Everybody, I can't thank you enough for joining on on a Monday. Next week, we return to the usual slot. So I'm very pleased to be able to say uh, I will see you all next Tuesday. Thank you all very much for watching and contributing as usual. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Bye-bye.